I'm happy to bring a group to the stage that doesn't need much in the form of an introduction. The team at HD Buzz works hard to ensure that people in the HD community have access to information about HD science and research, and that it's presented in a way that we can all understand. Not only that, but they help us understand that talking about data and HD science can be exciting and sometimes even fun. Here to share an update on HD research is the editorial team from HD Buzz, Drs. Jeff Carroll, Leora Fox, Rachel Harding, Sarah Hernandez, and Ed Wild. Welcome, you guys. Come on up. Mike, son. You, you can keep clapping. <laughs> the whole time, please. <laughs> Hi, Hello, every New Orleans. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Man, it's so early. <laughs> what are you talking about? It's like 4 o'clock in the afternoon in London. <laughs> the real time zone. Hi, everyone. My name's Ed. This Jeff. is Jeff. And um, we will be proudly presenting our annual HD Buzz research update. Uh, are these the slides? Yes. So looking at the logo for the annual convention, very pretty logo, it seemed strangely familiar. I don't know if it was familiar to you guys too. It is in fact the same logo for the uh, non-existent 2020 uh, HDSA convention in New Orleans which, for reasons I can't quite remember, turned into an online Zoom uh, uh, convention. It's all a bit fuzzy. Um, and uh, did not take place in New Orleans. However, we gave our HD Buzz research update on Zoom, and we kind of used up the New Orleans theme with uh, a talk called the Big Easy Research Rundown, and we had uh, divided the talk into sections about poe boys and beignets and dental floss. You'll have to Google that one. Um, the catfish poe boy was things that are famous but still very cool, like Huntington lowering. Um, so we can't do that this year. And I feel like we've used up all of the kind of major movie, sci-fi, fiction franchises. So we were a little bit stuck for a theme until this. So I was Googling myself, as one does. <laughs> Just me? <laughs> OK. Anyway, thank you. And uh, I found these amazing old videos on Vimeo, which I, I really went down a rabbit hole. But there is footage online of the first time that Ed and I ever did something like this, which actually happened in a context of a meeting called the World Congress for Huntington's Disease. It actually sadly doesn't happen anymore. So um, our good friend Charles Sabine, a uh, M former NBC of... Can, can we have the audio? There Thank we you. go. It's more exciting with the audio. So Ed and I did this nightly news for the World Congress where we introduced both clinical and basic research facts to the participants there in 2009. Um, it was the first time we did anything together on stage. Talent, which has been drawn from it no was the birth of HD Buzz. ...to help us in this task. So without further ado, let me introduce you to You've got to wait to, to see how skinny team. and Our how much hair we have, respectively. And care meetings. Jeff Carroll, who's from here in Vancouver. Very nervous. So tiny. <laughs> Such a baby. <laughs> Watch Ed, he's paralyzed. And all the way from in my fear. home country of England, Dr. Ed <laughs> I'm just pretending the audience doesn't exist. <laughs> he's gotten much better at public speaking. And I'm sure you'll agree, we haven't changed a bit. <laughs> so, uh, that gave us an idea with our new expanded HD Buzz editorial team. And this isn't just two white men standing talking while two women sit silently in the background. <laughs> We're not about that visual. <laughs> um, with our expanded HD Buzz editorial team, we proudly relaunch and reimagine the nightly news franchise. Ladies and gentlemen, we present the News Orleans. Hosted by us. But let me introduce our special reporters. She's the hobbit-sized scientist <laughs> whose self-written whose self songs bring joy to our hearts, Dr. Leora Fox. She's the stem cell queen who strides the time zones like a colossus, 
Dr. Sarah Hernandez. <laughs> and she's the protein wrangling Brit, bringing the power of King Charles III to Toronto. Joining us from outside the box and outside the nation, Dr. Rachel Harding. <laughs> and so it's over to Jeff for the news headlines. Lots of headlines to go over with you today that we'll be talking about, starting with the highs and lows of Huntington lowering trials. Results of the Proof HD trial of Pridopidine. Valbenazine emerges as a new Korea treatment. Do be, be more newsy. I was trying to, I got <laughs> conscious. A new generation, Tom and Nurson trial underway. CAGs in the crosshairs. Better. Better, good. <laughs> Stopping Huntington with a pill? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so, with our first special report, it's Dr. Leora Fox who's going to tell us what's happened. Please welcome her. Thank you, Ed and Jeff. In order to talk about the highs and lows of Huntington lowering trials, we have to talk about the basics of HD genetics. And no, I'm not going to bore you with a biology lecture, but yes, I am going to talk in this reporter voice until I forget or you get bored. <laughs> our genes, our genetic code is made up of nucleotides, which we represent with the letters A, C, G, and T. We have Hang on one second. I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> I need to introduce one additional element which our reporters are not aware of. Obviously. Those of you who remember the 2009 World Congress will remember something called the Nobel Bell. When one of us, Ed or Jeff, said a word which we thought, which Charles Sabine thought the audience wouldn't understand, he rang a little bell. And when the bell rang, the reporter had to explain what the word was. So, Leora, you just said nucleotide. Please explain what a nucleotide is. <laughs> She's loving you right now. Pardon the interruption. <laughs> <laughs> a nucleotide is an element that makes up our DNA. Thank you. <laughs> we represent these with the letters A, C, T, and G. We have tens of thousands of genes, and one gene causes Huntington's disease. Within that gene, there's a repeating sequence of the letters C-A-G over and over. Everyone has this repeating sequence of C-A-G. The average is around 20. People inherit one copy from, their, from each parent. People with Huntington's disease have one copy of the Huntington gene that contains more than 40 C-A-G repeats. So what we know is that this gene with extra repeats of C-A-G turns into a protein called, also called Huntington, and this is an expanded Huntington that's known as mutant Huntington. And the idea behind this is that mutant Huntington, the theory is that it builds up in the brain, it becomes toxic to cells over time, and over time those cells die, and that's what leads to the symptoms of Huntington's disease. And so the idea behind Huntington lowering is simply to get rid of some of that Huntington protein by targeting the message, the RNA, that creates that Huntington protein. And there are many ways that different companies and different academic researchers are targeting that Huntington RNA. And there are different ways that those types of drugs are being delivered to the brain. For example, spinally delivered ASOs are injected into the spine via, via a tap. <laughs> An ASO, <laughs> which I don't know if I really want to define antisense oligonucleotide, but it's a man-made piece of DNA. <laughs> it's a little man-made piece of, of, of genetic material that gets in, inserted into the spinal fluid that bathes the brain and spinal cord, and it can uh, find and attack the RNA for Huntington and stop the mutant protein from being made, or all normal and mutant protein. There are also viral gene therapies. There are surgeries that are, are being created to uh, inject a drug into different parts deep within the brain. And there are also small molecules delivered orally by mouth 
um, that are being used to lower Huntington genetically. And now I'm going to stop using my mouth to talk in this voice <laughs> and talk to you normally for a moment. <laughs> um, and so uh, it's been a rough couple of years for Huntington lowering. Uh, we learned in March of 2021 that the uh, Roche trial of Tom Anderson called Generation HD1 uh, unfortunately had to be halted. Um, that trial was testing this ASO in about 800 people across the globe. About a third of them were given a placebo containing no drug, and uh, a third of them were given Tom Nursen every eight weeks, and another third were given Tom Nursen every 16 weeks. And what this trial found is essentially um, that not only was Tom Nursen not helping, but in fact at the highest dose every, every eight weeks, it may have been harming people. People may have been doing worse in this trial. Um, and so um, Roche has collected lots and lots of data in this trial. And over the course of the last few years, they've been doing what's known as a post hoc analysis. They've been anal analyzing the data. But importantly, a post hoc analysis happens after the fact. And that means that they're um, that it wasn't really designed as part of the study. It wasn't something that they meant to ask at first. And so um, they, they did an analysis where they separated people who participated in the trial into different groups. And in particular, first I had shown you the data from everyone in the trial. And then they looked specifically at people in the trial who were younger, who started out younger, had fewer CAGs. And what that meant, essentially, was that those people started with fewer symptoms to begin with earlier in disease. And the, what you can see, there's a, the, the blue and the, the black are people who, are in, who had no drug or who had drug every eight weeks. The people in red, at, by the end of the trial, those are people who had had Tom Nursen every 16 weeks. And there seems to be some maintenance of those symptoms that maybe they didn't get worse. And I say maybe there, because this is, again, a post hoc analysis. We don't, it's not, it wasn't designed to do this. But there was some promise there. And so you'll hear after our commercial break a little bit more about what's next for Tom and Erson. Um, another thing that was shared just a few weeks ago at the CHDI conference in Dubrovnik, Croatia, was related to a protein called neurofilament light. Neurofilament light is a protein that gets released from dying and damaged brain cells into the spinal fluid. And it increases over time in lots of different diseases. And so ideally, a therapy for Huntington's disease would decrease levels of neurofilament light. And what Rose shared in this analysis is that in this trial, they're seeing that by the end of the trial, even after dosing was stopped, that perhaps people who had been on Tom and Nursen do have decreasing levels of NFL. Again, there's a lot more data, a lot more things to look at. But again, this was something promising that led to the development of the next trial for Tom and Nursen, which you'll hear about from Sarah Hernandez. Um, meanwhile, also in 2021, that same week that we got the bad news about the Tom and Nursen trial, we also got some news about two trials that were being conducted by WAVE. And WAVE Life Sciences has also developed an ASO to treat to lower Huntington. But in this case, it's attacking just the mutant form of Huntington, trying to lower just that expanded form. Unfortunately, for this trial, it was a small, these trials were smaller. They were mostly testing safety and Huntington lowering. And you can see each dot here is a person in the trial. And even the, at the highest dose of, of, this, of these drugs, uh, there wasn't really any Huntington lowering. So this was a shorter trial, but, um, and, it, and it came to a, a stop. The trial concluded, and then this data showed that it wasn't lowering Huntington. However, WAVE is now working on a third ASO for Huntington lowering. It has a redesigned chemistry. That trial is ongoing, and we will be updating you as soon as we hear any data from that. Now, uh, Novartis, I'll talk now about uh, an oral Huntington lowering therapy known as a splicing modulator, and Sarah will tell you a little bit more about that. Novartis was conducting a trial of a drug called Branaplam that was taken by mouth. It was originally developed for, not for HD, but for another childhood disorder, but in a strange twist of science, it also happened to lower Huntington. And so they were testing it in a small group of adults with HD. And unfortunately, we learned last year that this 
uh, trial had to be stopped for safety reasons. People who had been on Branaplan were developing something called peripheral neuropathy, which in this case meant tingling and pain and numbness in the, in the lower limbs. And it was much safer. Do you mean, do you mean legs? I do mean legs by lower limbs. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> there must be a Britishism that I'm missing there. <laughs> And so that trial unfortunately came to an end, and, Nov and Novartis is no longer developing Branaplan. We learned that in December. Leora, this uh, piece was, had the headline, The Highs and Lows of Huntington Lowering. We're getting a lot of lows. <laughs> we are. <laughs> Please, could we have some highs? So in addition to uh, Tom and Erson and Wave's ongoing trials, uh, there's also been the development of uh, a gene therapy by a company called Unicure uh, that's called AMT-130. And this is delivered uh, via, via a brain surgery. It's a, a harmless virus that gets delivered deep into the brain and uh, causes the, the cells to essentially become little factories to produce this genetic antidote against Huntington. And this trial has been ongoing. There are around 40 people all, all across the world that have had this surgery. Um, the first patients were treated in the US in June of 2020. In June of 2022, we saw some data showing some promising Huntington lowering in a few of the first participants. There was a, a pause for a few months last year as well to monitor safety. There were some people um, in the higher dose group. There's a high and low dose. And in the higher dose group, some people experienced some serious side effects immediately after the surgery. That then resolved. There are some new safety measures in place that went forward for the, uh, the next people who got, hunting, who got the higher dose. And we're expecting, by the end of this month, some new data. So, so stay tuned for that. And I know that Unicare is going to speak about that as well. So, um, so what's next? That concludes my segment on the highs and lows of Huntington lowering. And now I'll return to my silly voice for the <laughs> results of the Proof HD trial of Prodopidine. So a company called Prolenia has been running a trial of a drug called Prodopidine, which has been around for a long time. This was a large trial, the largest one. Of, it was uh, 600 people in this trial. Half received Prodopidine, half received a placebo. And the initial results of this study, preliminary results were shared just a few weeks ago, also at this HD conference in Croatia. And importantly, when researchers design a clinical study, they have to decide at the beginning what are the things that they're going to look at. What is the most important goal of the study? And that's known as the primary endpoint. There are also secondary endpoints, exploratory endpoints, other things we want to look at. In this study, the primary endpoint was something called TFC, total functional capacity. And that's just a measure of the way that a person is functioning day to day. So things like managing finances, self-care, uh, home, uh, home management, things like that. There was also a secondary endpoint of something called uh, the UHDRS, which is a measurement of lots of different things like that, that measure memory, um, movement, cognition, that's thinking, <laughs> ding, um, <laughs> mood, all different kinds of things <laughs> together. Uh, and that was the secondary endpoint. So unfortunately, we learned that the primary and secondary endpoints in this trial were not met. However, the news is more than the headlines. <laughs> so in this case, we talked about a post hoc analysis that isn't designed for a study. But in this case, uh, Prolenia had decided beforehand that they were going to look at a particular group of participants in this study. Specifically those who had not been taking drugs that were to control chorea, like benazine, tetrabenazine, osteto, and who had not been taking neuroleptics, also known as antipsychotics, which can be used also to tr control movement and behavior. And so in those people who participated in the trial, who were not on those types of medications, there may have been a trend for benefit. Um, and so, this, you know, this asks a lot of questions about what's next, about you know, what other kinds of analyses they can do. Sorry to interject. So does that mean that if someone's taking those drugs now, that they should stop? 
Absolutely not, Jeff. Okay. We don't have enough information to make any kinds of medical decisions based on this data. Mm -hmm. And if you are thinking about changing any of your medications that are working for you, these, these drugs have kind of big effects on quality of life. And so that's always something to talk to a doctor about. I'm just, I'm just giving Jeff a penalty for improper use of the bell. <laughs> <laughs> And I want to make it clear that Leora had not said anything incomprehensible. And yes. we, we honestly were not informed of the use of the, the bell, bell before this. <laughs> I felt Everyone gets out. to, I'm going to ring the bell later. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and so. Try it. So, so the bottom line for this trial is that the primary endpoints were not met, but there were other types of cognitive and movement. Uh, tests that did start to look promising in a subgroup of people. Again, those are not, were not statistically significant. And last night, um, this was confirmed by a presentation that, uh, that was given by uh, Prelenia. Uh, however, there's more, there's more data to come, and we, uh, we will see where this drug goes. <laughs> <laughs> Valbenazine was being tested in a trial by Neurocrine Biosciences. This trial is called Connect HD, and it's testing a drug for the treatment of chorea, which is already approved to treat a different disease called tardive dyskinesia that involves unwanted movements. Um, you can see in this graph where the, the longer pink bar is showing that people's uh, movements were, um, were lowered, were calmed down by this drug, and so this data was published uh, a few weeks ago, I believe, in its entirety, and Neurocrine is applying to the FDA for approval in Huntington's disease, and that decision is expected in August. And that concludes my segment on what's happening in HD research. <laughs> what's happening? Thank you. <clears throat> and with that, in the true tradition of network television news, it is now time for a commercial break. <laughs> Jeff? I don't know what shampoo to use for my hair. <laughs> oh, girl. I had that problem, too, until I discovered Enroll HD. <laughs> What's Enroll HD? <laughs> Enroll HD is a global platform study which enables us to work together to make big discoveries about HD, to improve clinical care, and to speed up clinical trials. Ask your doctor whether Enroll HD is right for you. Side effects of Enroll HD may include a sense of satisfaction about helping the HD community, increased contact with your HD clinic team, increased chances of taking part in a clinical trial, reimbursement for reasonable expenses, and opportunities to help with other research projects. Enroll HD is not directly affiliated with HD Buzz. This was an unpaid promotional message. The Enroll HD team were not involved in writing this commercial. They will be having words with me afterwards. Other, other observational studies are available. <laughs> but how does that help with my hair? It has nothing at all to do with your hair. Anyone can participate. Try Enroll HD today. <laughs> And we're back. <laughs> next on the News Orleans, what's next? With Dr. Sarah Hernandez. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. I'm excited to tell you about my first headline. Dosing is underway in several Huntington Loring trials. And I'll be talking about three specific companies. First is Roche that is testing the drug Tomonersen. The second is Vico Therapeutics testing VO659. And the third is PTC Therapeutics testing PTC518. I'm going to go back. <laughs> <laughs> so these are given slightly differently. The first two are given by, via a spinal injection using an ASO that Leora already talked about earlier. Uh, and the third is given using a pill that's a splice modulator, which I will cover. 
They're either in phase one, two, or phase two, and they all target Huntington, but slightly differently. Some of them target both copies of the Huntington protein, uh, but one of them specifically targets the expanded copy. And they're all either recruiting, either in the US or globally, or some have been paused, and I'll talk about that in my headlines. The first, trial. <laughs> the first trial is the Generation HD2 trial, which Leora referred to earlier in our program. And this differs from Generation HD1 in that they're looking at a more focused population. These are people that have shorter CAG repeats and are less pronounced in their disease. They're also reducing the amount of drug that's given and increasing the time. This is in combination with doing that post hoc analysis that Leora mentioned, as well as looking at different safety markers and biomarkers for disease progression. So in generation HD1, all patients received 120 milligrams of the drug, either every eight weeks or every 16 weeks. In generation HD2, people are receiving either 60 milligrams or 100, so that reduced dose, and everyone is receiving it every 16 weeks. Another major difference is that in Generation HD1, there was an initial loading dose, so that dose circled in red, that people were given after their first dose, and that was just a way to increase the amount of drug in the body pretty much right away. Generation HD2 is going to be doing CSF sampling so that they can track um, expanded Huntington over, the, over time. And primary completion is expected in January 2025. My second story involves CAGs in the crosshairs. And this is a drug by Vico Therapeutics that specifically targets CAG repeats. And by doing this, what they can do is click. <laughs> prevent wow. the production <laughs> of the protein. And so the gene stays the same, but the protein just isn't produced. And it's thought that it's the protein that's causing the harm in Huntington's disease. And so there are really two unique features about Vico's drug. The first is that it's targeting the CAGs. And so that means it's only going to go after the expanded copy of Huntington. And the second is that there is more than one CAG repeat disease. We all obviously very much care about Huntington's, but there are many other CAG repeat diseases, and that allows Vico to do a trial called a basket trial. And so along with people that have the gene for Huntington's, they're testing this drug at the same time in people that have spinocerebellar ataxia type 1 and 3. This initially is going to be tested in 65 people with early manifest HD. They're going to receive four doses over 13 weeks, and it's primarily designed to test safety and tolerability. And primary completion is expected in September 2025. <laughs> it's catchy, right? You like it now? OK. Um, so my third story that I'll be talking about is stopping production of the Huntington protein using a pill. And so this is that splice modulator that Leora talked about. And so a good analogy is if we think about our good friend on Channel 4, Ron Burgundy, fellow news anchor. Normally, he greets us all with a good evening, he relays the news, and then reminds us, of course, to stay classy. But if he were to move that message up and put his stay classy right after good morning, they probably would stop production of that program, right? It would be a terrible new show, and no one would watch it. And so the same thing happens with spice modulators. They take advantage of genetics in that genes also have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so at the end, they have this what's called a stop codon. It's basically a little stop sign, and it lets the molecular machinery know when they should stop transcribing or translating a gene. And so it moves that stop codon up, and so essentially it just has a beginning and an end. It doesn't make any sense. The cell doesn't bother producing it. And so that is how splice modulators work. Uh, PTC Therapeutics has a trial that's testing this. It is ongoing in Europe, but it has currently been paused in the United States. Um, that is because the FDA is asking for more data, and we don't have an update on when that will be unpaused at the moment. Sarah, that sounds a little scary. Does that mean that there's some kind of safety concern or something that we should be worried about? No, so that's a good point. So when people hear a trial gets paused, um, they get concerned, right? It usually means something bad is going on, but this is strictly paused because the FDA is asking for more data. So typically the FDA allows studies to go on in people as long as they have 
animal data for that amount of time. So if you did a three-month study in mice, you can do a three-month study in people. Um, so they're working on getting more data that will allow the, the FDA to kind of open the door, but it is completely safe so far from what we know. The study is ongoing in Europe, and so we're still waiting for data from that, and we're waiting for the FDA to unpause. It's being tested in 162 people. They're getting a daily dose of this pill for 12 weeks, and it's testing safety of this drug as well as its ability to treat Huntington's. And primary completion is expected in July 2023. Wow. Nice <laughs> 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 Snappy. Okay. Um, the last drug is by Anexon Biosciences. Uh, and this works by targeting the synapse. So this isn't a Huntington-lowering drug. And the synapse is a very small space between two cells in the brain, and it allows for communication between those cells. And you can think of this like a bridge over a river, like the Crescent City Connection Bridge here in New Orleans. Um, if cars are passing freely on this bridge, everything is fine. People can get to where they need to go. Things are communicating. But if there is an accident on that bridge, it backs things up, and it stops the flow of traffic. And if that accident were to go on long enough, really bad things would happen. And this is what happens in Huntington's. The cells can't communicate for a prolonged period of time, and it's thought that that backup at the synapse can lead to cell death in the brain. And so Anexon's technology uses this drug called ANX005 that's given intravenously that is thought to kind of help cells communicate better. It keeps the synapse healthy. And their hope is that if they can do that, they'll be able to preserve the health of those cells in the brain. Um, and so... Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're right. Go ahead, Ed. <laughs> so the last story... Um, really highlights how many companies are working in the HD space. Each of the names that are appearing on the slide is a company that has either somewhere along the line in the HD clinical pi trial pipeline. So they either made a public commitment, they have a trial ongoing, or they've had a presence at an HD conference. And so this is big news. Only a handful of years ago, there were just a few companies. And now we've moved to a slide that has over 50 company names that are all committed to working on Huntington's. Um, and so I'm Sarah Hernandez, and that's what's happening. <laughs> Uh, and now, very excitingly, joining us is our foreign correspondent out, from outside the box, Dr. Rachel Harding. Joining us live, right? Live by satellite. Oh, like, live. obviously, Make live no by mistake. satellite. This is live. <laughs> Definitely not recorded. Speak, speak to Rachel. Rachel, hi, are you there, Rachel? <laughs> can you hear us? Rachel? Oh, sorry, hi guys. I hope you can hear me over the howling tundra up here in Canada. Um, I've got to be honest, I'd much rather be with all of you in hot and sunny New Orleans, but I guess I drew the short straw on this one. Anyway, I am very excited to report some breaking news about a new type of HD therapy currently being developed and tested in the lab, which we learned about very recently at the CHDI Therapeutics Conference, which was just a few weeks ago. So we've known for a long time now that people with Huntington's disease who have exactly the same CAG number may start to get symptoms at different times in their lives. And so scientists have been trying to work out, well, why is that? And so using DNA samples from the thousands of people who have Huntington's disease, who have generously helped out all kinds of different studies, scientists were able to work out that some other genes might actually be playing a very important role into when symptoms start to happen. One of these genes is called MSH3, and folks who have small changes in their MSH3 gene tend to get symptoms a little bit later in life. So scientists now want to make drugs which are gonna target the MSH3 protein and hopefully either delay or slow symptoms down. There are two companies who are actually currently working on this right now who presented at this conference called Pfizer and Locust 23. They're both making amazing headway in trying to make these drugs that are targeting this MSH3 protein. And we're really excited to follow their progress and see how everything's going. So stay tuned with HD Buzz as we keep you updated on these exciting new developments. But for now, back to you in sunny Louisiana.
Rachel, that's very interesting. Uh, do you have any idea on the timeline for these uh, potential future therapeutic trials of MSH3 drugs? Rachel, can you? Rachel? Can you hit? Rachel, okay, I think we seem to be having a slight problem with the satellite <laughs> feed. Um, <laughs> could someone hum or? Could you, could you hum some music, please? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I'm hearing that we, we, we can now go live back to back. Rachel Harding in Thank Toronto you. for the next news story. Rachel. <laughs> Rachel. Rachel. Oh. Shoot, it's me again. Uh, sorry guys, got a little bit distracted there, but let me catch you up on some awesome things that are happening in HD research. We are living in an amazing time for science right now. So there are so many new and fantastic advances in all kinds of different technologies happening all the time right now. For example, it is now possible to look at cells from our bodies at the level of just one cell at a time and work out which of our genes are being switched on and off inside of that single cell. So when some people pass from Huntington's disease, they make this very brave decision to generously donate their brains to scientists. And the scientists then use these very precious samples to try and figure out all sorts of different questions that we might have about Huntington's disease, how it works and how we might treat it. So using these donated brains, scientists can use these new technologies to see what's really happening inside the brain at the single cell level. The brain is this huge, big, complicated organ uh, with a mixture of all kinds of different cell types. And with these single cell analyses, scientists can work out which of the cells are disappearing from the brain over the course of Huntington's disease and in which cells some of the biggest changes are happening. By working out which of these cells are vulnerable, we might be able to make all kinds of new therapies which could correct these changes and keep people healthier for longer. Stuff of science fiction even 10 years ago. This is Rachel Harding reporting for HD Buzz, over and out. I think that Rachel has ceased to exist. <laughs> I think she evaporated at the end there. Um, hopefully she's still with us uh, somewhere in, in the real world up in Toronto and staying nice and warm and busy. So that concludes our special reports on what's happening, what's next, and outside the box. Please give a bit warm round of applause to all three of our amazing <laughs> reporters and HD Buzz editors. <clears throat> and so now for our final segment, the heartfelt piece to camera. In all seriousness, this has been a very difficult time. OK, um, we had huge excitement about how much progress had been made. Huntington lowering, the first designer drugs made just for Huntington's disease, targeting the known cause of Huntington's disease. And we found out in 2017 that the first of those drugs definitely does reduce Huntington production in the brain. And that was a day of huge celebration, and rightly so. And then. 2021 came along, everything was terrible because of COVID, and then this double whammy of news, the rush program has had to be stopped early because the patients on higher doses of the drug were doing worse clinically, and the wave news, and then it almost feels like the bad news keeps coming, right? Um, Branaplam, just a few months ago, the Novartis trial, had to be stopped because the drug was on its way to damaging the, the nerves that supply the fingers and toeses of our uh, uh, patients. And that might sound trivial, but the nerves in the limbs, the upper and lower limbs, are not that different from the nerves in the brain. So we really don't want to be going into HD patients for sustained periods with a drug we've just discovered damages nerves. So that was the right decision. But it's bad news, there's no doubting that. What's really important to remember though is that a negative outcome is not the same as a failure. And we say this all the time, but it, we say it because it's true. The only failed trial is a trial that we don't learn everything possible from. 
So the Roche trial, of course, we wish it had ended differently. Of course, we wish that the Brenner Plum trial had uh, been able to carry on. But what we learned from those trials is precious. Okay, and it all goes back to this day, 30 years ago, in 1993, when the gene was first discovered. And that was when we really first got a grip on what it was we needed to do to fix the problem of Huntington's disease. So from that, that day, we knew the gene that caused the disease. Very quickly from that knowledge flows knowledge about the protein, which is damaging the brain. And that tells us, that gives us a, a, a menu of issues that we need to fix, starting with the gene and the protein. Um, and, you know, when I first started in 2005, this all seemed like science fiction, but it was 10 years later that the first doses of that Huntington-lowering drug were given. And that drug works in that it lowers Huntington, but unfortunately the working didn't work. <laughs> it didn't slow the progression of the disease. But we know that we can lower the protein. That's a solved problem. And we now have several drugs which we know can do that. The Unicure drug does it. Um, and in, the, in healthy controls, we've seen that the PTC pill does that. So um, you know, these things all happen in parallel. And we just have to remember that we, the sacrifice and the effort, uh, and in some cases, the discomfort and, and worry that the patients in these trials have gone through uh, we just need to make sure that we learn everything possible from that. And that's why we do these deep dives into the data like we're seeing from Prolenia, like we saw from Roche, and think about whether it's time for that program to stop and we, we take what we've learned and move on to another drug, or whether there's a potential hope for retooling that approach so that that same drug can be used uh, in a different way uh, to, with, a, with a higher expectation of benefit and with new tools like neurofilament light to help figure out whether the drug is pushing things in the right direction or the wrong direction. And um, what we want to do is move Huntington's disease in the list of incurable diseases from a column labeled untreatable to a column labeled treatable. And <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, in a way, it's such a small thing, right? You just click on the cell and you move it across <laughs> in your spreadsheet. Um, it's big, though. And, but while we've been doing this, I mean, not this presentation, I mean, like, in, in our careers, we've already seen it happen for multiple diseases. So a few years ago, spinal muscular atrophy, an incurable, terrible disease that affects children, was moved by an ASO, uh, t uh, t um, what's it called? The drug? Yeah. Spinraza. Spinraza, uh, from the incurable to the treatable column. And just the, this past year, since we last spoke to you, a drug called Tofersen, which is a treatment for a rare form of ALS, uh, motor neurone disease, uh, that drug turned out to work when it was studied for long enough, and it lowered the level of neurofilament, which means it's rescuing neurons, and it slowed the progression of this really aggressive form of ALS, and we were able to move uh, this type of genetic ALS into the treatable column. We think that that is possible and we know that that is closer than ever for Huntington's disease. This slide that Rachel showed is astounding and it's not just that there are lots of companies and these companies are not just in it for the money. Like, who cares if they make money? If they've got treatments for Huntington's disease, they deserve to make a load of money, I think, mm -hmm. as long as the drugs work and are widely available. Um, the point, though, is that these companies are involved uh, because they have seen the progress that we have accomplished as a community. Patients taking part in Enroll HD, families driving their patients to the clinic for a lumbar puncture, an MRI scan, uh, to take part in a clinical trial. And even though those clinical trials didn't, um, didn't get us across the line, all of these companies are in the business because they know that we, they've seen us move so much closer to that line. Mm. And then working in the background, diligently spending a ton of money, but also doing an incredible job of organizing the community and making the scientists work more efficiently, CHDI Foundation, um, really doing what is in some cases quite unglamorous stuff, like a big platform study like Enroll HD takes a lot of work 
and not much credit goes to the people who organized that study, but it generates so much knowledge and understanding, like the gene discoveries that Rachel was talking about. So, um, and the drug companies recognize the value of that sort of foundational infrastructure work. So, you know, in terms of where do we go from here and what do we do right now, I think participation is key from the whole community. The graph that Rachel showed, right, where there was this, this, these rare variants discovered that gave scientists entirely new ways to think about drugging Huntington, totally separate from knocking down mutant Huntington, came from a study of 9,000 HD patients. Right? Each of those 9,000 family members didn't donate their DNA thinking, hey, I'm going to help Pfizer find the unique drug target. They just wanted to participate, and they were willing and generously donated. And all of those samples, now I think we heard the meeting in Roll HD has 21,000 subjects. And you might think, my god, how many do they need? But each new technology that comes out lets us use these samples in new and totally unexpected ways. Um, so it's incredibly powerful. So if you're able, and if there's a site near you, uh, being a participant in Enroll HD is a great way to, to be part of the fight, um, whatever your genetic status, as long as you're an HD family member. And could we pause for a, to acknowledge everyone who's ever taken, a part, taken part in Enroll HD or has helped someone else to take a part? Huge round of applause to all of those yeah. people. <laughs> so, what about other trials? How do you find out about these research studies? We alluded to all these different companies working on this. Of course, not all of them are in the clinic today, and not all of them will be in the clinic near you, but how do you find out if they are? The HDSA has been really amazing in setting up this HD trial finder, which you can find on the website, where you can put in relevant information about you know, your status and what you're looking for and find drug trials uh, that are uh, near you to participate in research directly. Even more directly, um, some people had fun already, but there's still, I think, time until 1 p.m. this afternoon to participate in a, a biomarker study that CHDI is actually running here at the convention looking at eye movements. <laughs> Finally. What's a biomarker, Jeffrey? A lab test that we can do to track the progression of something like HD. OK, I'll allow it. <laughs> Thank you. So scientists are looking for all these novel ways, right? We've all done these like HD tests, everybody remembers, but there's like all these amazing new technologies coming out. Um, and this study uh, here in the room that I totally remember the number of. Check uh, in the app. Check in the app. Uh, you can find out and go participate in the TAP HD study. In fact, I, uh, I think one of our um, brave reporters participated and got a sticker. So there you go, there's something <laughs> in it for you. Um, another way to contribute uh, valuable um, samples and information to the fight is a study that some idiot runs called HD Clarity. Um, <laughs> some lovely young researcher, young researcher uh, runs called HD Clarity. So HD Clarity is a, is a way that HD uh, community members, uh, control subjects, people who don't have the expansion, and people who do can contribute spinal fluid, right, the clear fluid that, that covers the brain. And as you heard today, a lot of drugs for HD are being delivered in the spinal fluid. So all of a sudden, we have to understand how spinal fluid works and how it circulates through the brain and like very boring levels of detail. And we need lots and lots of samples. HD Clarity has lots of sites that are emerging across uh, the US. So if um, you haven't participated, but you'd be willing to donate that really precious resource of spinal fluid, uh, look for HD Clarity at hdclarity.net. Thank you. Finally, follow us at HD Buzz, right? You, the HDSA, were one of the earliest and most enthusiastic supporters of HD Buzz. We've always appreciated it. We will always keep you updated. And if there's something critical that happens, like one of these big trial updates, it'll be there. So don't feel like you have to read the crappy Google News feed, which is full of like, I drank blueberry juice and my HD got better or whatever. Just ignore all the crap. Stay tuned to HD Buzz. We're there for you, and, and we're there for you. Is that um, the new uh, slogan? Yeah. Ignore all the crap. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have time We to... are your only friend. <laughs> You don't need those other websites anymore. <laughs> Jeff, where, where does, it, does HDBuzz get support? <laughs> oh, sorry? Where does HDBuzz get its support? Thank you. HDBuzz has been supported um, by a consortium of lay organizations, including, the, as I said, the HDSA, the Hunting Society of Canada, the HDA in the UK. Uh, we never take any support from any pharmaceutical company or for-profit company at all. Um, so you don't have to trust us as individuals, but collectively, uh, we don't have any skin in the game except for keeping HD families uh, informed. And the... Okay.
And the final HC Buzz thing is that at 4 p.m. Oh, yeah. We're back. So if you're sick of us, don't come. <laughs> um, but we'll be doing our annual Ask the Scientist Anything session. Anything within reason. <laughs> Keep it above the waist. <laughs> above the neck. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so that's in the app, four till five, and then you can go and get ready for the gala. The gala. OK. And so, with that, some concluding remarks. I mean, I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I think our message this year is, it's been a tough time, but we are tough people. We are already... We're in this room because so far we've survived Huntington's disease and, by the way, we've survived a global pandemic hmm. while continuing to contribute huge amounts of data and effort and bodily samples to clinical trials to get those trials done and then to do the very heavy lifting of getting everything back up and running uh, in the new kind of post-COVID question mark era hmm. so that we can carry on without losing momentum. A good news day is coming. That is what we all believe <laughs> on this stage and in this room. We think, with good reason, that it is inevitable that we will be able to stand here one day and say, we have it. We've made a difference. We have a foot in the door. Let's build on that and really change the future. A good news day is coming. Let us make it happen together. That was the News Orleans. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, you guys. HD Buzz team, thank you so much. To all of you in the room, to all of you who are watching from home, thank you so much for taking part in the 30th annual HDSA National Convention. Have a great rest of your day. Please come back at noon today for the clinical tiles update and enjoy the rest of the sessions. And then as you are informed, four o'clock, you can ask the scientists mostly anything. And then we'll see you at the gala tonight. Enjoy, we'll see you again soon.